Thank you. Um, that was Abdul Qadir Saeed, who also is known as Argos. And thank you very much. We should give you another round of applause. Thank you. So welcome. My name is Charlie Sennett, and I'm the founder of the Ground Truth Project. And uh, the Ground Truth Project is a nonprofit news organization, and we're dedicated to the next generation of journalists, um, trying to really support them to go out and tell the most important stories of their generation. Um, right now, we're undertaking a project that's called Crossing the Divide. And we have selected five journalists from around the country, including one who is an alum of this university um, and who each represent different states and state universities, from the University of Massachusetts, from the University of Minnesota, from the University of Western Kentucky, from the University of Montana, and from the University of California, Berkeley. And these five reporters, led by two producers, have been traveling across the country to really try to report on, on our country at a time of deep division. I don't think we've been this divided as a country in a long time. Um, and in my lifetime, I'd say not since 1968, but I was only six years old at the time, so I'm not sure I'm a really fair judge of that. But I think we really are in a moment where we need to think about uh, where the country's headed. So we've set out on this journey, and we're looking at exploring issues that are dividing us, but stories that can unite us. And so in Massachusetts, we looked at education and the educational divides there. Really big income gap in Massachusetts and a big educational gap in Massachusetts. Some students are doing unbelievably well. Others are really just sort of not making the mark and, and the bottom is falling out from a lot of struggling school systems. Um, in Western Kentucky, we looked at a divide between perception and reality, the perception of Appalachia versus the reality of the place, which, which our reporting team found to be um, really doing a lot with innovation, uh, with technology, um, with all kinds of new breakthroughs. They're struggling for sure, there are problems, but there's also a lot of resourcefulness and resiliency there that the team uncovered. And now we're here in Minneapolis, uh, this great city, home of the Vikings. I'd say the Twins, but I'm too much of a Red Sox fan. I, 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 I have a hard time that, but the Vikings are indeed awesome. Um, so we're honored to be here. Thanks for having us to your city. Um, we are here, the guests of the University of Minnesota's journalism program, and I really want to thank the journalism program. I want to specifically thank Chris Eisen for all of his help uh, getting us settled here. So thank you, Chris. Thanks for having us. I'd like to do a super quick shout out to our, our uh, reporting fellows who are, who are sitting among you and they're just gonna stand up for a minute. I'll let them uh, sort of introduce themselves after the event or lean to the side. If you guys wanna stand up for a sec. This is our reporting team here. Uh, there they are. Um, we're gonna talk this evening about um, storytelling and Somali identity, and how important storytelling is to this wonderful, vibrant, amazing community here of Somali immigrants. And to get us started to really understand um, how important storytelling is to Somali culture, to Somali life, uh, we're gonna start off with um, the words and the wisdom of, of Professor Saeed Salah Ahmed, uh, who is a playwright, a poet, a filmmaker and a teaching specialist at the university's Department of African American and African Studies. I kept asking him, do I call you Saeed Salah? Do I call you Saeed Salah Ahmed? Should I call you Saeed? And what I've learned is the best thing to call this professor is Mualem Saeed, which means teacher Saeed. So I welcome Mualem Saeed. Uh, thank you, Charles, for your generous introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I'm compelled to say things very quickly. Uh, um, storytelling in Somali tradition, it's never different how powerful storytelling is any is a universal thing. 
But different cultures do have their own ways of uh, how they tell, who tells the story, and what is the unique setting of telling stories in that culture is particularly a unique one. I'll remind you that um, any tradition is mostly originates from the rural setting or environment. Imagine people who are rearing after their animals, looking the whole day, running, walking after goats, uh, sheep, uh, camels, and cattle, or tilling le the land and cultivating. Nobody sits idle at home. There is no possibility that even the young one not to do or take a role in that. At the end of the day, they are tired. And then they come back together in their home. There is the courtyard in front of the, dwell, the hut where they dwell or uh, live. And in front of that hut, there is a sign from the sky which tells them exactly when to gather together there. It, as soon as the sun sets, there appears the evening star in the east. And when everybody sees the appearance of the evening star, all animals are brought in. And then they keep uh, making fire in front of their homes. And when they do that, animals cannot be milked immediately as they arrive, walking all the day. These animals could not lactate and give milk. I don't think if men cannot imagine women who gave birth to children will know exactly how lactation and rest are related to each other, I'm with you. And then it so happens when everybody is there, these young ones should not feel as, uh, fall asleep. They have to be fed. So it is not a matter of entertaining only, but by reason, so that they can wait the milk or the greens that are being cooked on the fire. The bone fire or open fire is surrounded by the family members at that time. And the milking timing for the milking is the evening star. You cannot just go and milk, but there is a level where the, that star is. And then you milk the goats and the sheep. And there is another level where it reaches, and then you will milk the cattle. And there is another level, the last, where the camel are uh, milked. And according to this, every culture calls it a star, although it is not the bright thing in the evening. And before the sunrise in the morning, the dawn on the morning star is the planet of Venus, but they call it a star, Waharahid and Waberi in the Somali tense. Around the fire, therefore, children get not only stories for entertaining, the f animal fables, the anecdotes, the poetry, and all literature they receive uh, uh, is exactly related to the life. That is where they learn how to raise the animals or how to raise the agriculture and, and, and do the farming. This is where they learn who they are and their background. In, the, in, in, in their existence and identity. This is where they learn hundreds of poems and then can recite among themselves later and are called the nation of poets. This is the gathering around the fire where the, the real formal education of that environment is passed from one generation to the in the daytime, when they are out there with the animals, they come together from the different families and different homes. Under a tree, they interchange the stories they heard last night. And that's how it is so significant that stories link people. And therefore, hearing from there how the family members respect each other by receiving. This is how the young ones know that their parents are knowledgeable of something. 
not at present as here that they think they are ignorant, and that is how they how they teach them. And then this family story is passed to the other family and to the other community and to the nation. And therefore, when people have the same stories, moral stories, believe same ideas, and have the same in relation to the storytelling, is when their minds can be in the same set. It is also the same in the agricultural area or where the marine life is. But in the urban um, home, the same stories are told in the living room there. These stories also, the setting may be different, but the idea is the same. In the diaspora, it is the same thing that these stories are to be told. Uh, they are so much significant in the classroom where a young Somali student attends. It is uh, storytelling for Somali culture is both for education, the link between generations. It is the making of point of an adult in their oration or wisdom. No adult can say or start a speech. Uh, they, they, they couldn't let me say how many proverbs I would have started or the poems to say. This is how they do. Or they tell the story. And uh, uh, the reason for the story will be understood at the end when that m person is making their own. This is what raises their self-esteem and how they know. That is how I found that students here in the States, in the classroom, where I taught a number of years in Minneapolis public schools, were not able to participate in any talented and gifted program except in the storytelling, where they could hundreds or tens of stories to their beers. Therefore, Mm. This being the case, I have a story to tell. Not a story as a story. It is a real thing that I met. How I met Warsama this summer in a city fairly, I was in Burro. It was the Ramadan, the fastening. And then there was an email that came from somewhere in the United States. I was asked uh, if that I can contribute with uh, benchmark uh, textbook writing uh, company, uh, some writing of a literature story of, uh, about Somali literature. So I created the young Warsama who is suffering in his class. Warsama is spelled as, as W-A-R, not war, but war. And S-A-M-E, not same. His classmates tease him, ah, from Somalia, same war. That is why he was given that name. But uh, the blessing news, the blessing information is the meaning of the name. People like Warsama are really those, his parents, he was told to write a poem for him, to participate and compete among other classes. Uh, that was so difficult, but his father took him to Somali museum and to Somali community and gave the, him an inspiration for his poem. And then he was able to write. Both Warsama and his family need the crossing dividing to be helping. These are the people who will need the truth ground and the real reporting if it will happen, waiting the younger generations, those who, their stories were not told in the same way. Warsame, in his poem, tells me to say how I came from there 
to me my adventure, my journey, where I have been and where I will be. Listen for the bells. You will find me how I came from there to here, how I came from where to near. At three, a hat protected me. At four, I crossed over the seas. Listen for the bells, listen for the bells. And for, and hear my story. The story from there to here, the story from near to where. At times I could feel and cry, and now I think and try. Listen for the bells, listen for my bells. The story from there to here, the stories, the story from where to near. Thank you so much, Mualem Said. Thank you. That was beautiful. I, I, I just want to pause for a moment on that line, the story of from there to here. Um, it's a beautiful poem, and thank you for reading it. I'd like to do one more round of applause for Mualem Said. Um, I'm going to invite the panel to come up. And, and we can start, uh, if you would just come up, Bihi, if you'd come and sit at the farthest end and just go in, in a row. Thank you, and Fatima, and Ifra, and just come on up. While they're coming up, I'm just going to um, say that the story of from there to here is what we're going to be talking about today, the immigrant story, and specifically the Somali immigrant story here in your city and trying to really understand the role that storytelling plays in that, but also to look at one of the great stories of immigrant communities uh, all over the world, but definitely here in America, which is a generational divide that can sometimes open up inside an immigrant community. You have those who remember the war and who are from there, and you have those who came here young or were born here and who don't remember the place as much or who don't know it at all because they've never been there. Today, we, we really hope to explore that theme that runs through this, this community. Um, this is an amazing panel. I'm going to introduce them, but you also have their titles and their names here. Um, and just to, just to go through quickly, I'll introduce first uh, Abdi Razek Bihi, also known as Bihi. He was the director of Somali Education and Social Advocacy Center. And he's host of KFAI's Somali Link Radio. And I had the great pleasure to be on with Bihi on his radio show just the other night. Uh, thanks for being here, Bihi. Thank you. Um, next to Bihi is actually Fatuma Mohammed, who is a poet and student at the University of, of Minnesota, who's been really talking about studying and, and learning a lot about preserving history and working very much with the Minnesota History Center. We're going to have you frame the history, and I love that you are one of the youngest among the panel, and you'll be helping us frame the history. So thank you for being here. <laughs> Next to Fatima is Ifra Mansour. Um, Ifra Mansour is a multimedia artist and playwright. Her, her show right now, a multimedia show, uh, is playing right now at Mia, and you need to go. And we're so honored to have you here, Ifra, and your father, Argos, who was playing the Aoud for us earlier tonight. Thank you. So I really love that we have two generations right here in the audience. How many of you out in the audience do represent the fact that you are among two generations here? Anybody else? OK, great. Honored to have you all here, uh, especially if you cross the generations. Um, I also, I want to introduce also um, Abdurazak Omar, the artist uh, also known as Cisco. Uh, and we uh, will be referring to him as Cisco. He's an artist. He's a youth mentor and organizer uh, and works still, I think, with, with Mixed Blood Theater. Is that right? OK. OK. Thank you for being here. Cisco. 
and Saido Shale, who is the president of the Minnesota UMA Project, uh, and she's the governor's appointee to the Minnesota Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee. And thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. So I am going to just launch right into questions, but we also really want to get to your questions in the audience, so please be thinking of them. We have an amazing panel. Um, thanks for being here, all of you. I really appreciate it. Behe, I feel like you are so far away, but I feel close to you because I got to hang out with you on your radio show. Um, Behe, maybe you could start us off. Um, your, your radio show touches uh, the community. It, it's, it's, you're deeply involved in the community. And you were one of the people uh, in, in talking with my brother, Rick Sennett, who is here. Speaking of generations, we got at least two brothers. I don't know if that doesn't count. We're one generation. But Rick Sennett is a photographer, a longtime photographer with the Minneapolis Star Tribune. He's my older brother and um, someone who really opened our eyes to the community. And one of the first people he told us about is Behe. And um, you began to help us see that there really was a story here that we need to know about. Uh, to understand that the generations um, need to learn more from each other, that, that to keep the, the art and the history alive, that's a big part of that. Just help us set the framework for where the generations are and what work you do to try to bring them together. Hello, everyone. Uh, actually, 2008, I started to work directly with you. And uh, each year, I learned a lot of stuff. So first things I learned was that was giving a challenge to young people in my community. I thought it was economics, jobs, uh, after school programs, sports, uh, arts engagement. But I've learned something else. I've learned that they were isolated from the first generation, from us. And that isolation was created by culture and also language. So language and cultural barrier existed in my household, including myself. Um, I have two daughters, one is 15, uh, 15, one is 12, but she thinks she's a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So they, their first language is English, they don't speak Somali. And my wife's first language is Kiswahili, she's from Kenya. Um, and my primary language is Somali. So we communicate all of us English. Uh oh, Behe. This is you're the guy in radio here. <laughs> is mine? I usually go home with this song. <laughs> I've got a couple of them. Um, so, so we have a the, the gap we see at home in, in my own household where they don't like Somali food, they don't like to eat goat meat, they don't like to eat anything Somali, and um, they like to eat American food, and we want to preserve and like Somali food at home. And also, they don't like the way we say things. So they, they belong to a generation called Sewalahi. And so they didn't like the name Sewalahi. Sewalahi means uh, in Somali, when we talk, if you tell me something that kind of new to me, I said, or something unbelievable, I ask you to swear on God. So Sewalahi means swear on God. Uh, so we call them Sewalahi until I find out that they also have a name for us, FAB, which is fresh off the boat. <laughs> so the more, we, the, the more we listen to them talking, the more we learn. Um, so we, and some people come to me into the community office and say, hey, my, I think my, my, my supervisor is a racist. I think he's, he doesn't like us. And, and, and he says, they, they, they say, you people. And I say, there's no problem with that. My kids call us you people all the time. You know, <laughs> we are still immigrants everywhere. So there's a huge divide. And one time, I really brought Somali elders and young people together. And um, I asked the elders to say who these people are. So there's a young girl who doesn't wear hijab, but has a couple um, rings on her nose and wearing jeans and there's a guy who's sagging and a thread lock and the elders started these people we think they are gangs are they out of jail basically they were 30 year psychology at Oxford College and 30 year engineering in U UFM but 
That's how much we are disconnected with our young people, not only language and cultural barrier. Thank you. And now, Fatima, I give you a chance as someone who, when we were talking just before, and I was talking with you about the Say Walahi generation, who <laughs> took a step back. Um, I want to hear from you as someone who's really studied the history of, of your, your country, of Somalia, and of its connection here. I want you to just jump in and tell us how your, your work and your history helps you understand where you're from. And, and do you think your generation, the younger generation, understands that history, not just the war, which looms so large and even to this day shapes so much of life there, but do they understand the history of art and culture and, and how would you defend your generation against this clear fob here? <laughs> 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 um, well, I mean, in general, I feel like the divide is usually seen as something that's like young versus old, but to say that that's the case isn't true. I mean, you could be an immigrant, you could have come to America at any age. Mm -hmm. And so to say that something's like Sewalahi versus Fab is, I guess, it's a bad framing. It's, it's, a, it's a weird framing. Okay. Um, the work that I've done with the Minnesota History Center has focused a lot on the idea of why is there a lack of preservation of Somali history and where that necessarily comes from. And I think when it comes to maybe like the youth that are not from like directly like born in Somalia, there is a lack of necessarily conversation surrounding culture, the art, and poetry. And a lot of that comes from this idea of where we just immigrated. You know, if my father is the first immigrate, immigrant in America, he's not gonna be thinking, well, where do I preserve my stuff? He's thinking, how do I save the livelihood of my, my family? He wants to find a job. And then he wants to make sure we can secure good jobs. So when it comes to things like preserving art and stuff, that's seen as like a privilege. You know, mm -hmm. it's important, but how important is it when you first immigrate? And when it comes to the youth understanding the history, it's because a lot of the time I have the privilege of going. Oh, sorry. Okay, I have the privilege of going to school, and um, if my parent, both my parents are working. Then how often do they get to share the stories? We don't have time to maybe like sit around the living room if I'm gonna help take care of my siblings while they help take care of me, you know? So a lot of the times we end up looking for art elsewhere. Mm. Like, goes in, sorry. We look for art, art like art in Somali culture elsewhere. Mm. And let's say I go to the library and I look for Somali the art, then a lot of the times the name that's attached is in Somali. Mm. So, and that's a problem, you know? If I go to the, for, like for example, uh, recently I went to the Burnsville Library mm -hmm. to look for, on like Somali literature and poetry, mm -hmm. but the name attached to it was Russian. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah. That's, that's, that's somebody who affected my country. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't want to get my information from colonizers, but if I can't get it directly from my parents, where do I get it? Yeah. That is a, that's really, yeah, I'm, I'm with that. That's, that's, so. that is um, beautifully said, and I want, um, thank you. That's great. I was just going to ask for that. Um, we're going to, we're going to come back to you, Fatima, because that is so wonderfully framed. And I love the way you understand your history and you're claiming it. And, and talking about the practical side of art and culture might have to take a back seat when you're looking for a job and you're getting mm -hmm. settled in a new country and you have a family that's, that's really still caught in a war and you're worried about them. I mean, the incredible burden on the community to deal with these is something that we're here to learn about tonight. So thank you. Um, if I wanted to, if I may, go to you to talk about how you came to art as an expression. Um, in, uh, clearly, you have an artistic family, um, and music must be an important part of that. But tell us about your work as an artist and what you think about here in this society. How does your work as an artist help this community come together? Whew. That's really big. <laughs> um... Well, uh, well, I discovered art accidentally as I was on my journey to get a job, to pay my phone bills, to go to college, pay for the loans. 
um, and um, um, that job just accidentally was at a theater called Mixed Blood Theater, mm -hmm. and um, I got to see these African-American women, um, uh, um, Afri African-American female artists just, you know, owning their stories, owning um, all that they are on stage, and I just felt like I really fell in love with that expression, um, and I'd wanted to express my story and my experience and validate it um, on stage. Um, and I think, um, so uh, I started doing Willy art, really weird art at the beginning, because um, I just wanted to find what, um, how I could tell this rich story that I have. Um, and um, eventually it sort of grew into crazy titled shows called How to Have Fun in a Civil War, um, which uh, really focuses on the experience of children in a civil war. Um, but it also really tackles on this idea of like, um, how do we find and create safe spaces so that we listen to our elders? Um, and how do we also let the elders get in the room and have them listen to the kids? Because I think wisdom goes both ways. Um, there's so much that the youth can teach us um, and there's so much elders can teach us and we just need to create that safe space. And I feel like art lets us do that mm. a lot of times. Um, and I feel like art um, is this accidental recorder of history. Um, and that's what I love about it. Um, and you're able to tell, um, you're able to share uh, sometimes traumatic, sometimes painful experiences um, through the arts. And I feel like that creates a little bit of access um, then more so than, I don't know, any other mm. um, media or news or television. Can, there, there's just something about it, art that lets you um, tell stories deeply. Art um, sometimes gets at truths that we as journalists can't find. <laughs> I, I, I really believe that. And yeah. I, um, thank you. Beautifully said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cisco. Um, Tell us about your work. You also are tied to mixed blood theater, um, and you are doing a lot of different kinds of work um, as an artist. And I'd love to just hear a little bit about, about this mentoring role that you play, too. How do you, how do you bring a message to your generation or to a younger generation that you see as a mentoring role? What are you trying to share with them? Um. They're not actually a younger generation. This is my generation. I am okay. young. <laughs> how, how old are you, if I may ask? 20. OK. I'm 20. Uh, so when you say mentor, are you mentoring peers yeah. who are your age or younger or my both? My age, younger, okay. older. So what do you say to them? Like, What do you have to share with them as a mentor? Um, it's just kind of like um, I learned from my older brothers and just pass it down to them. And uh, when I was very young, you know, um, when I first got into art and there was a couple of people that kept me around and kind of mentored me. Um, there were after school staffs and whatnot. And uh, I just took that knowledge and, you know, when I became stable on my own and I wanted to give back mm -hmm. to my peers. So What's I became a mentor. What's your core message that you're giving back? What do you want to share? For them to follow their dreams, speak um, freely, and also, um, especially, you know, with youth and East African youth, they're all naturally talented, very talented with um, poetry or um, music stuff and kind of just encouraging them to follow. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. Follow their dreams. Follow their dreams. These guys right here, are these among the talented many, right? They're that you're talking yeah. about? They just feel them. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for being <laughs> here, you talented, awesome generation. So good to have you. <laughs> Seriously, beautifully said. Thanks. Really, uh, I love your your bearing, and, and you know we're we're just sort of getting to know you. But I know our reporting team looks forward to talking with you, working with you, and and finding some of those stories about people who are pursuing dreams in, in the in the Somali community and in the East African community. Thank you, Saido. I want to uh, pr pronounce your name correctly. First of all, am I doing that, Saido? Um, and I want to. Um, I want to just ask you about your role. Uh, if you would help open up for us your work in the UMA project and also the role of religion. 
I'm very interested in religion as a, as a way for the community to pull together. You know, too often I think the media has focused on the ways in which it's dividing the, the Somali community and there's been some, I think, I think the focus has been off. We've been using the wrong lens. Uh, and I, I'd love you to help, help us see how religion um, plays out in your work and, and how it shapes some of the messages you might share with the community. Or, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's, it's there, but it doesn't need to be articulated. How do, you, how do you present a force as powerful and as meaningful as religion as a way to pull people together? Thank you so much. Um, hello to you all. Um, my name is Saido 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 Shai. Um, I came to America as a young child, um, and um, as you understand, coming to a new society, a new way of life, a system, and how um, you know leaving everything that you knew to come into a whole new, different world, and. Um, for me, it was not easy, um, especially when I came. It was very difficult because there was not, not that many Somalis. And so I had to learn my way, my own way of, you know, fitting, trying to find who I really am. Um, and at first, it was very difficult, very difficult. And I had to live in two different worlds. So when I am home, I am home, so I'm dressing like the Somali young child that's obedient, that's you know, wearing the hijab, that's doing everything that she's supposed to do. But when I leave home, I need to fit in because I was the only uh, different person. That I was the only person that has the hijab. I was the only person that didn't speak the language. I was the only person that never been to school setting. Um, so all, I mean, you can imagine all those different you know, levels and titles. So I had to learn my own way of leaving those two differ different worlds. One area, make sure that my parents, you know, is raising the ideal daughter who is dressed up the, the way they want. But when I go to school, I wear my jeans. You know, my mom do doesn't know. I have to put my hijab and everything in my, <laughs> put it in my backpack, put it in my backpack and then go to school and make friends because that was the norm. Like everyone looked like me. You know, at first, a lot of people thought that I didn't even have, a lot of the kids didn't thought that I didn't even had hair. And they were thinking about, like, who's, like, why is she this way? But I had to figure out my own way. And uh, somewhere ad along the line, after my f parents find out that's what I was doing and I was in big trouble, um, somewhere along the line, I had to f really find who I was. I had to f decide who I really want to be. And from there on, it took me a couple of years, I would say. Um, one day I read a verse from the Quran that says, um, you respect you, your values, um, and, and, and your principle and religion, then everyone else will respect you. And that kind of, that sat with me for quite some time. And I had to go back to figure out what that really, that, what, what does really, means to respect yourself. And going back to my experience and trying to figure out who I really want to be and kind of like disattaching myself from the ideology of my parents, not necessarily like really leaving it, but kind of like creating my own way of understanding that. Um, I had to go back to the stories that we were talking about to um, to study the, the Islamic religion and understand what really it means to be a Muslim woman. So from there on, um, that gave me a power because that showed me that no one is higher than Allah and that everyone else is like me. And then I understand from there on, religion might be unique, religion like talk about all the different religions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, all. Like we have more similarities than, 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 than differences. Like you can count the differences that we have, but the similarities that we have, we all want to live a, a humble life, a education, safety, like everything, 
uh, that I want to have family. I want my kids to be successful. I want to have a better job. I want to live in a beautiful house and beautiful environment. So everything that I want is what everyone else is, is looking for. And so there on, I'm like, so then why are we different? Why do we think we're different? We're not different. I might dress differently. I might braid differently. But at the same time, at the end of the day, we're all human. And if I cut hair, what comes out? Blood. And I think everyone else is the same. So the thing that really unites us is more uh, profoundly uh, uh, big and beautiful that what really like the thing that we can touch and so today we're here like we have so many different people different cultures different maybe speak different language but what united us we're all Minnesotan we came to hear the show and so like we're all the same so when it comes to religion we can create all these different things that divides us. And there's one thing that I really want to make it clear here that I want to actually claim. I wanted to claim the religion of Islam is a peaceful religion. And that everything that we hear from different groups like ISIS, like um, um, Al-Shabaab, it's a, it's a man-made ideology. It's not the religion of Islam. Islam teaches you to take care of your neighbors. Islam teaches you to not uh, uh, steal, to work, to be truthful, to not lie, to, I mean, that's the beauty of Islam. And so when I see this as ISIS, ISIS are not Islam, they're actually killing Muslims. They're actually raping Muslim women. And so think about it. So when you kind of like uh, um, bring that into perspective, religion is a beautiful thing and religion is all, it, it, this world, I mean, everything have a law and order. And religion teach us to, to take care of our families, to work, how do you um, uh, raise your kids, to, you know, to be clean, uh, to pray, to take time off. I mean, everything that we are all about is what religion teaches us. So from there on, uh, uh, the idea, since I grew up here as a young child, and I have experienced so many different I had to learn who I am. I saw, uh, 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 I saw that a lot of the Somali youth who came, who were at the same age as I was, who were actually struggling like I was. And that's the when that idea came up of, you know what, maybe I can lend a hand. Because yesterday I was there, and I'm lucky because I see myself as a successful woman. Um, because I understand who I am and I know who I am, and I respect who I am, and I have something that I can call, you know, this is what defines me, then I can lend hand. And that's when I come up with the idea of creation, creating the, the UMA project, which starts with building a recreation center. Mm -hmm. and Thanks. I, 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 just looking down the line, I love, I love the way all of you have articulated different sort of power centers for bringing people together, whether it's, it's religion or dreams or art or history or communication. Um, I think that you really have uh, a powerful message for your community. Now, you guys better go off and really believe this, right? That's where you're going right now? <laughs> Um, and I wanted to share with you, I, I want to say I'd love to come back to each of you for, for one last quick question, and then we'll go to, to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, I want to encourage you to, to, to bring it together now. And do we have a microphone or something for people to ask questions, or should they just stand up and speak clearly? I'm getting a feeling it's stand up and speak clearly, because I'm not seeing microphones. So, We'll, we'll need you to stand up and really articulate your question in just a few minutes. Um, and as we go to, to the questions, I wanted to share with you a little bit um, from my perspective. I, I'm from Boston. I'm from, uh, my brother Rick and I are from a different tribe that's Irish and Boston and Red Sox <laughs> and, and, a, and a really wonderful culture. And it's one that also revolves around storytelling. So for me, being here, listening to you tonight, I feel really drawn to your stories because I feel like it's part of our story. 
the power of storytelling, how our history, also a history of colonization and oppression under the British, how the history of, of music in Irish uh, background was so important, and poetry and dreams and religion and how generations would struggle with religion and some would leave it and some would hold on to it and there would be struggles around that. And definitely around communication. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the Irish became journalists. And I'm seeing that, uh, that there's a Somali youth that's becoming journalists too. And I feel just compelled to add that I feel very connected to you guys. And I think the stories that you tell are really the story of, of America struggling between generations, finding a way forward. Every different ethnic group that came to this country, unless you're Native American, um, we came from there to here, as Madame Saeed put it. And that journey from there to here has these constant themes that run through it. And then I want to say, but yours is really coming at a tough time. And, and I want to just go right into that. You're here and in this land at a time when it's, it's, it's never been easy for anyone. Everybody's had it tough, but I, I might argue that right now, I really feel it's, it's really tough for you guys, and I want to hear about that. I want to go right into, uh, we are a deeply divided country around a lot of issues. And I want to just ask you, I'm going to go right in a row, and if I could ask you to try to stay to a minute or two each, just your gut reaction. How do you feel, um, these tensions, these, these elements that you were talking about, Bihi, in, in, in the Somali culture right now, the generations pulling apart, does this divided time help pull you together because you need to look out for each other? Or do you feel it makes it more of a strain and harder? Actually, the Somali community has been suffering huge problems for the past 25 years since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Millions of Somalis fled Somalia to all over the world. I mean, if you go to a little town in Brazil, you'll find a Somali halal store there. Um, <laughs> so, we were over at the mall today. It's so, pretty amazing. And every summer in this community, we see families yeah. who are Somali Norwegian or Somali British or Somali German or Somali Swedish who come visit here. And it's fun to see families who doesn't understand each other. I mean, parents understand each other, but kids, cousins, nieces, nephews don't understand each other. And that also shows you how, but the divide gets smaller every time there is a backlash. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a problem for the community. We come closer together. Um, and as I said, language plays a big role, the language barrier between the elders and the young people. But historically, every now and then, there was an issue whether it's a flee in the country, whether it's uh, issues in the camps, whether new home issues, where there's uh, some Somali kid does something wrong, is the Somali community did this wrong. And um, so those problems put this, gave this community a sense of our resilience that every problem that comes, we are assured to ourselves that it will pass. Mm -hmm. But they never stop. <laughs> it never stopped coming. So the issues of division in the country, it's not healthy for anyone. And especially it's worse for a community like us who happen to share more mm -hmm. things like being Muslim, being person of color, and also being an immigrant. Uh, community. So those three issues also become to lead the division, to, to be played with as, as a stick. When one group wants to fight the other group, it's the immigrant issue, it's the color issue, it's the religion issue. So actually, it doesn't get any better, mm -hmm. but the resilience gets better. The resiliency of your community to deal with those three things, um, to deal with, with, with race, to deal with religion, and to deal with being an immigrant, it's amazing to watch. And I, I, I'm really inspired by it, the, Actually, the way you're resilient. Actually, we had a disaster. We had a, a kind of like very bad shooting. Mm -hmm. The first thing in any Somali person will ask is, is that person Somali or a Muslim? Right. 
So, right. and everyone's in the community. We were calling each other up, you know, that night. So, that's what happens. If something bad happens, we ask. Right. Because, the, unfortunately, in this time, the society doesn't look at the person right. in our community. It's just the group. Um, Fatima, if you would help us uh, understand this moment right now, really divided. Uh, you know, you're, you're young, and maybe, maybe the divisions aren't as, as apparent to you how deep they are, but really the country seems, this country, seems to have lost an ability to have a civil dialogue. We're so split between left and right, and immigrant and non-immigrant, and between rural and urban, and so many divides. What, what can you tell us uh, from your experience how, how you, your generation, is going to navigate this very divided time? I think that, um, as you were saying, you are talking about Irish, like being Irish earlier. Um, I know that one of my favorite authors is actually Irish, James Joyce, and he mentions, um, like, was it light and darkness or darkness and light? Either way, I do think that it is important, though, that we keep things specific and that when we do talk about a community, it's, it's that community. Um, when it comes to situations, though, I think when you're talking about divisions, um, there's a difference in divisions within a community and divisions against the community. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to acknowledge that when you talk about things like art in the Somali community, there's a big difference between is it the correct time to start preserving art and then how do you feel like to be um, antagonized in media mm -hmm. are different conversations. Mm -hmm. There's always two sides, but in general, the side that's being oppressed is usually the side to focus on. And unfortunately, we don't have that representation in media or mm -hmm. in other forms of things in general. So I think when it comes to our specific situation, conversations like this are very important that don't happen as often as they should. And so I think that as time does pass, thank we, thankfully we do have, like as you were saying, um, we're seeing a lot more Somali journalists people that are taking things into their own hand and finding their own platforms that, that weren't there before. So I think in that case, I think that it is rather hopeful to see people doing things. And it is unfortunate that there, we are stigmatized, but thankfully we do have a lot of people that are taking things into their own hands. And for that, I'm a, I appreciate that. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ifra, how do you, as an artist, uh, draw on your art to, to navigate a really divided time in our country? And maybe, um, do you see any way that, that art can help America, too? I mean, the whole country is divided. How do you think you, as an artist, can set an example for a wider American community? Well, um, I truly believe that art is healing um, and that art allows us to create a safe space. Um, and um, it, I, I also feel hopeful as well. Um, I feel extremely hopeful because I feel like um, um, I get to work with these brilliant, um, what is it, um, um, East African elders that are learning for the first time. And they're learning English so that they, um, they too can communicate um, with, uh, with their grandchildren um, that speak very little English. Um, and uh, so I feel like every now and then I'll eavesdrop on a, like a, this like really powerful conversation. And the last conversation that I eavesdropped on was um, 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 this grandma is uh, uh, conversing with her um, 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 granddaughter and the granddaughter was talking about how um, a family member um, is no longer able to come to America and, and, and sort of um, um, the granddaughter is asking, Grandma, but why? why? Why can't she, you know, why can't our family member come? And um, the grandmother, you know, um, simply listed all the things that 
they, um, um, she has overcome like a civil war, you know, you know, living in America as an elder, being Muslim. Um, and she just listed all the things that, you know, makes her strong. And she goes like, this is nothing. Okay. We're going to face this. We're going to be all right. So I feel like, um, I do feel the need to show the strength and the resilience um, within my art. Um, I had this crazy idea to get elders and kids and teens to build a traditional Somali house with non-traditional stuff, and we were able to do that. And um, just teens and elders coming together was just a beautiful joy of connection. And um, I, and I truly feel that, especially this time and age, we're going to look at untraditional ways to bring people together, untraditional ways to examine, to connect. Um, and uh, um, the greatest quote that I ever heard was that the distance between two people is a story. And I think that really sums up the power of storytelling. Um, and we just need to keep telling stories. like empowering stories and not, um, not if it bleeds, it leads kind of a thing for the media people, but if it empowers, it should lead. Um, and I think that's what I'm attempting to do with my art. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, I'm starting to get a little bit into losing out on time for questions. So if I may ask you, um, Cisco and Saido, if you would, if you would um, share with us your thoughts and, and know that you can also come back at them through some of the questions, maybe. Um, but but uh, Cisco, just tell me about this, this idea that we are so divided as a country. You just look at what is happening to this country and you're part of this country. What do you, when you look out at it, what do you see? What do you see in those divisions and how do you see yourself um, impacted by those? I mean, it's really tough, um, especially like as a youth right now. Um, we're not at, at the table and we have so many things that is against us. Not only that, oh, um, we have to act our own way to fit in, but organizations are, you know, like, can we participate in certain things? And now there's this CVE program going on and everything that kind of labels us oh, um, we have to watch out for you um, that so you're not a potential somebody. What and now what you think. Briefly. CV is a um, countering violent extremism. Um, yeah. It's a Department of Justice money to basically, you know, to um, surveil on the youth to yeah. if they're a we potential. We a lot about it, maybe too much about it. Uh, right. So, and, um, you know, um, the youth are just trying to be themselves mm -hmm. and, you know, not act a certain way to be an American or act a certain way to fit in to, into their own community. Mm -hmm. So well said. Thank you. <laughs> Saido, quick question for you. You have a daughter, right? Does she try to wear jeans and then hide them from you? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Tell us about your, your, your sense of this as a mother. Um, you have uh, an amazing sort of power behind you, informed by your faith to bring people together. But it must feel awfully hard these days uh, as a person of faith to look out at the way faith is used to divide and faith is used for violence and faith is used in different ways. H how do you see this moment of division as a person of faith? It's, it's a big and broad question. But I, um, I believe that from deep in my heart that um, what is happening right now in America and how we see people in a different lenses putting them in different hats, you know, giving them different titles. You're Muslim and you're Jew and you're this and you're extremism and you're white supremacist and you're all this. I mean, it's just, it's not something that I'm used to. Growing up, I never had to think about that I'm really American or not. 
when I was growing up, I used to think about that can I make friends, that can I have, um, be successful in the school, and can I not wear the hijab? I mean, I never had to peel under the lines, I mean, to figure out what does, why am I different? Not like consciously think about. And I remember that when um, President um, Trump was running, he came to the Twin Cities and he actually shed a light for the Somali people say, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to not be here. And that he was supposed to, why are you here? Go back to where you're from. Mm. Like it was really like he said that in public. And from there on, through my social media, a lot of people actually send me saying, when I write something, hey, go back to where you're from, go back to your country. And Do you feel it's more now after uh, President Trump was elected? Or was it always People there? are able to, um, there's groups who are able to actually say that out loud. Mm -hmm. Because it become, uh, if your president gives you the okay mm -hmm. to actually say that to a specific group, then you see that as being so kind of influence and motivate them to say that. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the majority of Americans are peace, beautiful, loving people, and that, you know, me coming to America and having the opportunity to, to go to school and, and get educated and raise my family and get to work and create non-profit programs and be active in, in the community, I wouldn't get that any other country. I mean, knowing that even if I go to Somalia or Africa, the, or, or in the Middle East, sometimes you're not even going to get the citizenship. So in that sense, America is the greatest thing that happens to us, like coming to America and being part of the bigger fabric. But at the same time, like you hear a lot of things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. will make you think about consciously to question yourself. And one day I remember, so there's two things that I want to tell you. My son was actually watching. I was in the room, but he was watching some... I think was some, something from the TV. And um, he was, uh, um, he came across CNN um, talking about Somalia. My son just ran to me in my room and he just grabbed me, but mom, let's go. I'm like, what's going on? I just, I, I didn't know. And he's like, let's go. And then he took me to, to the, in front of the TV and said like, look, your people. And I look at him like this. And I'm like, my people? Uh, and then who are you? I thought you were my people. And he's like, no, 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 not me. Your people, like where you came from. And I was like, Lord have mercy. <laughs> it, was, it was so interesting because at that moment, I realized that my son is 100% American. And anything else that he sees, he sees Somalia. I am Somali and maybe some American, but I'm not fully American, but he's the American. And I was like, goodness Christ, I never thought about that. So that was one thing. And I remember when President uh, uh, Trump was, um, the, the day he was uh, elected, my kids did not want to go to sleep. They were actually watching. They wanted to make sure that Hillary Clinton wins. And so they're just sitting there, mm -hmm. And I had to put them to sleep and say, it's getting too late. I don't know what's going to happen. And my daughter got up early in the morning before she talks to anyone. She just goes and then up, go to the TV and then CNN. And she's like, my goodness, did that man really want? And I was like, you're only seven years old. I mean, I never thought about, like when I was young, when I, I mean, never, even, even when I was having my own kids, Never until the you know last couple of years right. that I have to consciously think about politically, like who's getting elected, mm -hmm. who doesn't like us, yep. why they don't like us, why am I Muslim, why am I? I have to answer those to my question, my kids, and it's not easy. So I have four sons, and one of the things. Um, you know, that, that Fatima, I think you'd relate to is this, how do, you, how do you have young people get a sense of history? And I am very aware of the presence of uh, a leader in America in 1968 who was trying to bring the country together, and that was Hubert Humphrey. This, this building, Cole's Auditorium, has an honoring 
of him here as someone who was a real bipartisan spirit, tried to work both sides, didn't win, of course. But think back to 1968. You have Martin Luther King assassinated. You have Bobby Kennedy assassinated. The country is literally in flames. The war is raging. There are protests. Civil rights movement is, is stalling in some places, and, and, and people are angry. Cities are burning. We have been divided before, and we found our way out of it. And, and I, I'm, I'm encouraged by all of you as sort of leaders who are going to help us all think about how we're going to do that. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I want to, we have, we have a little bit of time for questions. I'm sorry we went a little bit over. We can probably stay a little bit over too, but we'll understand if someone has to leave it exactly at 630, uh, we will understand. But are there questions? Yes. Okay. Anybody have a question? We have one here. I have a question. Sure. Chris. <laughs> and can you introduce yourselves? Before? Yeah. Hi, I'm Gabriel Sanchez. I'm the fellow from Minnesota. So we've talked <laughs> or a text message. Thank you and good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so like I said, I'm from Venezuela, and to your point, I also grew up in two worlds. It's not, it's, I'm making sure that we're talking about one group in particular, to your point, which I think is fair. Um, but I also did grow up in two worlds, and it was different being at home than in school. And now that I speak perfect English, I can pass. But um, what kind of collaboration have you seen from other migrant groups here in the Twin Cities in helping your community. Um, I know that we have different experiences, but we do have commonality in, in terms of the two worlds thing. And my family's super Catholic and I'm not, for example. So there's similarities there. So what kind of reaction have you seen from other migrant groups? Great question. So that towards me? I knew, I, it, it's open to anyone, but if How you have an answer. How about if one or two of you answer and then we'll, I'll start to bundle some more I'm questions. Sorry, what was your question? What kind of collaboration have you seen from other migrant groups within? Other minor groups? In the Twin Cities Twin proper, Cities. Uh, so, given some commonalities. Okay. Ifra, do you want to take a shot at that too? And, and maybe say, and then Bihi, if you have something to add, jump in. Yeah. So um, I know that Somali community have been here for the last 15 to 20 years. So, you know, up until a couple of years ago, we were still trying to find out figure out, you know, who we are and where, not like who we are in, in uh, people, but kind of like figuring out the system, how things work, settling, understanding in the, um, how American um, way of life and, and kind of like settling. Um, but I believe that there's a lot of organizations. I know that there's the, um, uh, the African American and the Somali community had some sort of a collaboration that was funded by, I know, um, <laughs> and other groups. Um, I know that in, in, in when I was finding out the, the, the idea of, of building the recreation center, it was not only me. I had to kind of like find ways that I can collaborate with other groups to, to, to bring the idea um, to a bigger audience, not only specifically for the Somali community, but we'll collaborate with big agencies like the Mortis and Construction who build a Viking Center to actually collaborate with us to, to do the blueprint. Um, we have um, t t uh, mediation training where we invite different groups to come and be part of. Um, and then and the Hmong and the, the Somali community are also mm. trying to. So right now, you can see there's a lot of groups who are coming together to figure out, hey, you know, we're all immigrants, we're all um, um, new to this country, we're all, so let's come together and learn together. But not something that's really tangible, that's really out there, but the communication already starts. Anyone else? Um, uh, I've done a project uh, um, a long time ago um, that attempted to bring, uh, um, uh, attempted to bring peace and connection and belonging with uh, uh, Somalis and uh, Native Americans. Uh, here in Minnesota, we have a huge, um, uh, what is it, um, housing discrimination that's happening. And um, um, what often happens is, is that um, 
um, young uh, Somalis, um, what is it, um, new uh, young Somalis um, tend to uh, reside in neighborhoods that, that were predominantly Native Americans that I feel like are getting displaced. Um, so you've got these, um, 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 these rich communities that could have connected um, otherwise um, that are sort of, uh, what is it, uh, penned together because of uh, limited resources such as housing. Um, so we did a play where we brought uh, Somali youth and myself and uh, Native American uh, youth to do an exchange. Um, it was really transformative um, and I hope we continue works like that because there was so much connection, um, there is so much rich, uh, what is it, um, teachings um, from the Native American um, elders that I felt like exists in the Somali elders and I'm like that's just, that connection is just, yeah. that space needs to be created because it's there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I, we could bundle a couple of questions um, if there are others. Yes, maybe if, ask if there's a question up here. Um, and uh, do we have any other questions here? We have one here, one here, and one here. So let's, let's, um, let's, if you ask your question, then I'm going to come to you three, and I'm going to ask you to bundle them, and we're going to close with you guys, okay? But what is your question? Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you um, for bringing your courageous voices into this room. Um, and I just want to um, ask a question. So it's really wonderful that you're all here and on this panel and are speaking your truth to all of these people who are willing to hear, and that's amazing. And truthfully, I feel like people who attend these events are usually people who get it, who want to change their perspective and who are, who are flexible in that. And so I'm wondering, as community leaders, how you try to share your truth with people who don't want to change their perspective. Great question, hard question. First of all, I want to tell you, or tell, share with the audience, there are people that we collaborate. Uh, a lot of people, we work together. Right here in the audience, we have Jay, Jay Persk and his wife, Cynthia, that does continuous outreach to bring Christians and Muslims together to the point to where they founded a night called Shah and Sheko Night <laughs> each month, which means tea and, and, and Sheko, which is a story tea and story every, once every month. So there are tons of good people that are bringing people together. Um, one thing I find out is to a lot of people do bad things or think bad, badly of you because of ignorance. So that's one of the things I did personally. I went on, I volunteered as a, um, as a Somali radio that speaks funny English at KFAI. And I invite people in my community, or who does the work in the community. And um, I invite Ilhan Omar, representative Ilhan Omar. I invited Somali female farmers out in the rural area. So I get to invite police officers, you know, doctors, you know. So a lot of people are learning that we not only have some issue, but we are just like our neighbors. So I think it's a great work on our side to invite our neighbors uh, into our mosques and go to their churches and present about your community. There's a lot of fear. So we've changed a lot of hearts because they wanted to know. Uh, I might also just quickly add that this is being recorded um, for radio broadcast on KFAI. Uh, it's also being recorded by Minnesota Public Radio. And we hope to share it through these two partners. So you have a chance to encourage people who might really um, learn a lot from this conversation to listen in that way. We also invite you to follow the journey where we'll be, we'll be sharing parts of this on our, on our site. And that is um, if you go to xthedivide.org, this whole reporting journey of Crossing the Divide is here. And we really encourage you to Get other people, pe you, beautiful point. People who aren't here need to hear this and we, we should be reaching out to them. Maybe that's a way we can do that. Um, going back to that question though about um, how to approach people that might not 
um, understand you as a person, I think there is a big difference between like genuine ignorance and chosen ignorance. <laughs> I think people who are gen, like you can tell when somebody approaches you and asks you a question if they're being genuine or if they're going to wait until you say something and then try to drag you down. I think when it comes to actually educating people, you can present anything to anybody, but in the end, it, what they choose at the end is something that you can't control, unfortunately. So I think when it comes to situations like that, um, there really isn't, unfortunately, there isn't really much you can do. I mean, there's a, like, if somebody were to approach me like genuinely and be like, oh, like, Father, tell me something about like your culture, like I genuinely want to know, that's great, you know? But if somebody comes to me and like they clearly have like a Confederate flag on or like a Trump hat, and they're like, what's your religion? Like, I know where this is going right off the bat. And there isn't really much I can do besides attempt to get away from that. So um, I don't know. I think that it's something that is like, I guess, larger than just, the, in this situation, it's larger than just the Somali community. It's something that I feel like a lot of like minorities in general have to deal with is when do you open up and when do you talk about yourself genuinely? to somebody who doesn't understand, because in the end, we don't know how the people are gonna take in. So I think that's something that we all are just trying to battle together, so. Thank you. Uh, we, had, we had a few other questions, but I'm gonna get them all in once and then uh, go through them quickly if we can. So there was one here, yeah. Okay, is this on? Okay, perfect. So, um, would you share who you are and then a really quick question if you would. Yeah, my name is Lexi. Um, I'm a grad student over, I study over on the uh, East Bank. And it, so in my studies actually, I've been uh, recently hearing the word resilience. And I love that word. So I never heard it before, but I wanted to ask what, I know what resilience means to me, but what does resilience mean to um, maybe you personally or the Somali community? And and how can we support, like as a Minneapolis community, as a St. Paul community, as a Minnesota community, how can we support the Somali community so that Somalians can be resilient? Excellent question. And there was a question here. Uh, Your name and a really quick question if you yes, could. My name with witness against torture. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to pick up on the opening theme that Professor Sennett brought up. And that's I'm no the, professor if oh, you're referring okay. to me. I'm okay. just a Anyway, reporter. how would you relate story to the game? And the, you know, the word immigrant ends in the word grant. The institutions at this university are Bud Grant and Tony Dungy. Question. Okay. Uh, will Tom Brady, 199th draft choice, win the Super Bowl here against uh, in Minnesota? Okay. Thank you. And another, we had, we had one other question. Um, here, it was here. Yeah, thank you. Last question. My name's Abil, um, and I'm a first generation at Eritrean student at the University of Minnesota. I wanted to reconnect about you know the cultural barrier that's been disconnected with the Somali community. I think the question I would have is, is that what would be what what is there is a way to try to reconnect with this with the Amer with the American philosophy and with the Somali uh, uh, culture and try to formulate those two cultures together? Because I remember growing up in my family in, in the Eritrean household that there have been times where the, the cultural disconnect can be a bit of, more of a bit of a divide. Mm -hmm. So it's like, mm -hmm. would it be a way to try to reconnect that tradition and culture and try to and make sure to have those philosophies infused together to try to become one a uh, one true community I think I understand your question but I, maybe can you phrase it really short one more time and give us your first name again my name's a Abil Abil okay just I, I think I get it but maybe just give it to me in about six words okay what is a way to try to reconnect try to uh, reconnect both of the cultures of both the Somali community and the American community too, to try to avoid the cultural barriers from happening. Okay, great, thank you. So I think two, two really good questions, um, and, and one that I'm afraid we don't have time for, as much as I'm a Patriots fan. Um, resiliency, um, it is a word that 
is used a lot, particularly in reference to your culture. You are resilient. Um, how much do you relate to that word? Is that a good word that you feel uh, describes um, some of the way in which the Somali people have, have um, navigated their lives here in America? Who wants to answer that? Cisco, we haven't heard from you in a while. Um, I'll go second. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go second. Um, well, resilience, when I hear that word, I remember my mom. Um, when we came to America, seven of us and my mom, no father, only my mom and seven of us. Um, she did not read or write Somali. She did not speak, read, or write English, yet she had seven kids. And she had to take care of all of us. And guess what? All my f family, all my brothers and sisters are very successful. We have doctors, we have um, secretary of, of, of um, going back and, and doing something, business people, um, and, and me. Um, and so it, when you think about it, it's like failure was not an option in my mom's you know, ingredient. Not one bit. So everything, every day when we come, she doesn't understand. She comes to me and she says, show me your homework. I mean, she doesn't even understand, but she just gives me that, show me your homework. She just flips the beverage, she looks around, just, you know, and, and, and it was like, so then bring all of us together, sit down and help one another. Brothers, help, is it right? She did, it. I mean, she was there 24 seven, cooking, cleaning, um, taking care of everything while she doesn't understand anything. And, only thing that she cares about was the success of these kids. And that's resilience to me. Very, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is that power that would not let you down. That power within you that gives you the courage to get up every morning, regardless of where you are in this world, because there's bigger things. What she cares about was our success, and that was bigger than anything else. And that's a resilience. That's how I see it. That question is really interesting because when you think about the American culture and the Somali culture, I think we have what different what different as is is. Um, there's a lot of barriers that would not allow you. But when you think about it, we integrate. We don't assimilate, though, but we integrate. And so in order for us to be together with everyone else, we have to learn how to approach people, how to speak one-on-one. -on -one. I will tell you one story. I went back to Somalia I, one month I, ago. You know what, you know what I got to do? <laughs> Stop me. I got to because... Stop me. Because we're, we're really at the end and we have a really Absolutely. special, um, really, really special thing to do at the end. But I want to just say, I, I want to quickly, we have the two questions frame each other wonderfully. And, and I can see that you want to help us bring this home and you promised to come back. So w you two help us close this out, if you would. Okay. Um, I think with resilience, I mean, resilience only comes with struggle most of the time, which is rather unfortunate. And so I think that whilst we are very resilient as a community, it's only in opposition to unfortunate events. So I hope that it comes a time when we don't have to continuously be combated with difficult things. Um, when it comes to the American community as well, I feel like we are at this, I guess, point in our like general Somali experience where you do have a lot of people like referring to themselves as Somali American, which you didn't see before. And so I feel like there is, like as you were saying, like rather than like assimilation versus being like completely like like traditional and stuff, you do get this like integration. And to the third question, I'm I'm really shocked that Tom Brady is still allowed to play after deflating the box. So, like I said, we don't have time for that one. Um, Cisco, we have like 30 seconds. I'd love you to just just bring us 
bring us home on a point here. This, this culture question is perfect for you, and the resiliency question is as well. Um, as much as I like that word, with the how many times we have heard resiliency in our community when it comes, it comes with this um, package of we have to be resilient about, about some, against something mm -hmm. that has nothing yeah. to do with us. Maybe somebody that looks like us has committed, but we mm. have to come in and take that responsibility and say, we don't do this. Why do we have to uh, defend the community mm. when it's not the community that has done it or anybody that, you know, has anything to do with us? I love that we end with the future generation. Mm. Yeah. And we end with a, a kind of meditation on resiliency. And I also share your great hope prayer, maybe even, that, uh, that these things that are in front of your, your, your culture and, and your society that make you have to be resilient, I do hope that there's a time when you're just uh, a much more comfortable part of the American family without all the struggle. And uh, thank you so much for all of the wisdom up here tonight. Thank you very much. Our panel, you guys, if you would, you could sit down uh, in the front rows here. And I'm going to um, just shift. We have one last thing to do that I'm really excited to do. Um, and I want to just um, give, if I can find my glasses, because this is going to require that. Sorry. Give me a second. No, I think I got them. But someone did leave theirs, maybe. Um, I, I want to just say that, that this, this uh, journey we're on, crossing the divide, is really about a new generation of storytellers. It's about a new generation of journalists. That is what we are all about at Ground Truth. And one of the things that my brother Rick has done as our photo editor uh, for Ground Truth and someone who does a whole series of, um, of, of featuring and profiling what we call emerging photographers around the world. It's something I really invite you to look at on our site. It's a really powerful part of what we do. I love it. Rick has an amazing ability to find talent, to find young talent in the world. And he definitely found talent in Brittany, uh, who is here, who's one of the reporting fellows and has worked closely with her. Um, but what he did this year is, is work with some young Somali photographers and teach them in a workshop. Um, and has found great talent right here as well. And thanks, Rick, for doing that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I am going to invite uh, our friend Abdi, Abdi Raham Mukhtar, uh, who is the Youth Program Coordinator at the Brian Coyle Center. And he's one of the first people I met here in the Somali community. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, and. Um, what we're going to do here, I'm going to get out of the way because we want to share uh, the winner of, of this photo contest uh, that we've put together for the emerging Somali photographers. Thank you. Um, my name is Abdurrahman Mukhtar. I am the youth program manager at the Brian Coyle Center of Blissbury United Communities. Every summer, our youth program teaches kids um, either coding photography or photography, or encourage young people to really find ways that they can tell their own story. And we are very lucky this year to work with Rick. Um, a lot of young people use um, social media, but also they use their iPhones or their you know, uh, cell phones nowadays. So when we were thinking about what is the best way for us to teach uh, photography, we knew a lot of our kids don't have access to cameras, but they do have access to phones that have cameras. And, and this year we did, um, how do you take a professional photo um, using your phone? And Rick was teaching that class. Um, and I believe Behe took one session <laughs> with the kids. Um, <laughs> so our kids were taking photos, but, um, and, some of them were really very talented, to be honest with you. The same way um, Cisco, um, Efra, and you know, Saido, and Fadum mentioned, our kids are very talented, but they really need an opportunity, um, whether it's mentoring other young people, um, opportunity for employment, 
or an opportunity to uh, um, learn new skills. And the winner of our photo contest, um, and also she took most of our youth program photos, actually. The most amazing pictures that she took um, I really will be posted on our um, website. But for see who's here, um, for see Mohammed Hussein is the winner. Uh, <laughs> um, so for see, she doesn't know this, but um, I contacted her dad, who is in you know Africa, to give me a little bit information about who she really is, other than what I know about her. <laughs> uh, so for see, Mohammed Hussein is a South Mora South um, West High School, and. The same way her older siblings, Zakaria and Fadumo, um, took post secondary classes while they were in high school to get on college credits. She's doing that. Um, she's really outgoing, but I didn't know Fosia um, also is a musical. She tried to learn how to play the guitar. Um, that's what I found out. She played sports a lot. But what I really loved about Fosia was she's always smiling, and it, it's really. When me and Rick went through the photos, when we tried, um, only um, one person came back again and again, and she's, she really have a talent. I don't know if we are showing one of the photos, but yeah, she took that. And she used that, she used her iPhone to capture that. And imagine, you know, her talent. So I wanna call for see you here. <laughs> Congratulations. We, um, uh, we, we, so, so the idea was um, we're so impressed with your work. It's truly extraordinary. And we, we want to make sure that you have the resources to buy a camera because working on an iPhone is great. And if you can create that image on an iPhone that celebrates the joy of your community, the resiliency, to use a word that we've been talking about, but what I love about it is it's, it's the hijab and a Vikings sweatshirt. Like that's, to me, that's like you have done the most wonderful job of telling the story of your community. So congratulations, really, congratulations. So we are, we're honored, um, we're really honored through our uh, funders to be able to share uh, with you a gift certificate at the Apple Store for $500 for you to be able to buy a camera. Uh, yeah. Or whatever you would like. <laughs> it could just be another iPhone. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to, do you have anything to say? Please, come right up. We'd love to, we'd love to hear from you. about the photo, about the class, about, about yourself. This yeah. is the thing about fame, it's completely unfair. You get thrown up here and you just have to say something. Okay. So my name is Fozia and the reason um, how I got this photo was on one of the girls, the one with the gray sweater that's like screaming into the sky, was telling everybody a joke and telling them like, to like, let's, let's take a funny photo and like, you know, let's, let's have fun with it. And then I said, okay, I'll get it. And then I didn't know like this photo was gonna be like taken, like, taken nicely, but I really liked it because everybody was happy, everybody was smiling and stuff. So, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Abdi. Um, Abdi, the work you do is amazing in the community, and I, I feel like I've only gotten to know you recently, but um, just so, so impressed with the work you do. Thank you. We've gone way over time, but this is something else the Irish share with the Somalis. A sense of no time. Uh, we really truly get this in my family. Uh, we, we've gone way over time. Thank you all for staying. Thank you for a wonderful night. Thanks to the journalism program. Thanks to the university for having us. Thank you for coming. <laughs>